but I'm one of those people who needed to stop by the potter's house this morning. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the presence of the Lord? We welcome those of you who are joining us from the north to the south, from the east to the west, and we say welcome into the sanctuary of the Jackson Revival Center Church. We're so glad to have you here with us this morning, and we pray that you're going to be blessed by the word of the Lord. Before we go into the word, we want to lift up some prayer requests very quickly. Uh, we've had many within our church body who have experienced uh, the death of loved ones, many of these things that uh, were pre-existing and things that people were dealing with. But we want to lift these families up because their hearts are hurting nevertheless. And if you've never lost a loved one, you probably don't really understand what that's like. But when you've lost a parent, when you've lost a friend, when you've lost a loved one, your heart cannot help but be filled with compassion when you see other people going through, when you see other people hurting. And so we just want to pray for those who are connected to our church body uh, this morning as we prepare to go into the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our church family. We thank you, Father, for adding so many great people to this church family. And Father, we thank you for each one name by name, face by face. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to do life together, to grow together, to learn together. And Father, now we lift up those who have lost loved ones. We lift up those who are going through uh, tragic situations even now. And Father, I ask that you would just minister peace and strength and life unto each one. Father, we lift up the Haley family. We lift up the Gardner family. We lift up uh, Brother Harry, Father, and his, his family and the loss of his brother, Brother Harry Wilson. Father, we lift up each and every one of these families. I lift up Pastor Ruth Thornton to you right now, and I lift up her family and her children. Father, as her husband has been released to hospice. Father, you know every single situation. You know the cries of their hearts. You know the pain that is so deep within. Now, Father, we just ask that you would wrap your arms around each one. Father, give them peace that surpasses their natural ability to comprehend and understand. We ask that you would move even beyond what we can move. Do what only you can do. Comfort, strengthen, and give peace. Now, Father, we ask that your word would fall like rain in this house. Father, we've come today because we want to hear from you. Father, we've come today because we need to hear from you. Father, this may be somebody's last opportunity to receive the word of the Lord. Speak to us in this moment. Father, tell us not just what we want to hear, but tell us what we need to hear. Somebody's heart is broken this morning. We ask that you would bind it up. Father, somebody's mind is confused. I ask that you would put them at ease. Father, right now, I'm asking that you would send your word and heal your people. Call somebody's soul to be saved, somebody's life to be transformed. Call somebody's faith to be fortified. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we speak it and declare it to be so. Somebody said amen, amen, and amen. Well, we are excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time this morning. Hallelujah. We have been in a series on sonship. Series on sonship. And I tell you... It is one of those situations where the enemy has fought tooth and nail uh, ever since this series has started. And uh, I was just praying and, and meditating on some things this week. And the Lord uh, brought some things back to me uh, that my father told me early on in ministry. And he said, one thing you have to understand is that it is your job to obey. 
People's response is not your responsibility. And he taught me that the word will drive you or it will draw you. That the word will draw you when your heart is right toward God. Even when God brings correction, even when God sets things in proper order and brings alignment, when your heart is right toward the Lord, it will draw you. But when your heart is not submitted to God and you are not ready for change, the word will drive you. So some will be driven, some will be drawn. Nevertheless, we're going to be faithful to give the word of the Lord. And so if you will, grab your Bibles. Let's go to Ruth chapter 3, Ruth chapter 3. Um, sometimes I preach line by line, text by text, but this morning I'm more preaching along uh, subject lines. And so I pray that it will be uh, a blessing to you. I'm going to do my best not to be too long, um, but I'm going to do my best to give you what I feel the Lord has given me. you got to understand that information uh, is powerful. And there are certain things that once you learn those things, those things that you've learned give you access to things you didn't have access to before you heard what you heard or learned what you learned. That literally when we come here on Sunday mornings, we open our hearts, we open our spirits. When we leave, we're able to go places that before we could not go. Pastors and teachers can save you from a lot of pain. But if you made up in your mind that you ain't going to hear anything they got to say, then pain itself becomes your pastor. Pain itself becomes your teacher. That you have to learn how to embrace God's voice for your life. That God puts people in your path who have gone through things and experienced pain in order to gather knowledge that they can share that knowledge with you that you shouldn't have to duplicate their pain. It's ridiculous for you to have to walk through some of the stuff you walk through when you can let somebody else's pain be your wisdom. That when we come in here on Sunday mornings, you got to understand that when we speak the word of God, words are seeds. And words create tomorrows. And so I'm praying that at our time together today, uh, that God's going to speak a word into your life that will create a tomorrow that is so much better than your today. Jesus said, I'm come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. God didn't come for you to have a miserable life. He didn't come for you to have a mediocre life. He didn't come for you to have a life just getting by or existing. He said, I've come that you may have life and that more abundantly. That's a life that's filled with peace, a life that's filled with joy. And the Bible said, happy are those whose God is the Lord because because God makes great things happen in your life when we allow him to be Lord. And so I want to talk to you this morning that you can be seated. Uh, I'm not going to go just line by line, precept by precept on Ruth chapter 3. But it's going to be a background uh, text for uh, what I want to share with you today. And so we've been talking about uh, sonship and we've been talking about what it means to live life covered and that also means embracing the voice of God for your life that when you can hear and embrace God's voice for your life it'll get your life moving in the right direction again the voice of God in spite of your weaknesses knows your potential and knows how to pull it out of you and so uh, this whole year uh, through the preaching of the word of God God has been pruning and cutting and dealing with our inner man because many of us up until now we've had what is known as seasonal fruit um, that we have had moments of success We've had moments of success and they come and they go. We've had moments of happiness and it comes and it goes. We've had moments of freedom and it comes and it goes. But the Bible said in John chapter 15 that God will prove anything in your life that is not bearing fruit. 
Anything in your life that's not bearing fruit, God has promised he will come and he will prune that. And then he says that anything in your life that is bearing fruit, um, he's going to come and prune that too. And so you're pruned if you do, and you're pruned if you don't. And so you say, well, pastor, what is the goal of the pruning then? Well, the goal of the pruning is that we may bear much fruit. And that the fruit that we would bear, number two, may glorify our Father which is in heaven. That He said, you're not producing fruit for the fruit to glorify you. He said, but I'm doing a work in your life to cause you to be fruitful and productive that what you produce will bring glory to me. And then the third thing is, he said, not only do, you, do I want you to bear much fruit, not only do I want your fruit to glorify your Father which is in heaven, but Number three, he said, I want your fruit to remain. I don't want it to be something that comes and goes, something that's here today and gone tomorrow. He said, I want your fruit to remain. So God is removing and cutting the things from our lives that are inhibitors to our destiny. And so that brings us into a place um, so that he can bring us into a place that you can keep what God gives and not lose it. In other words, God's saying, I don't want to just provide you with a blessing that comes and goes. I want to provide you with the kind of blessing that comes to stay with you. I want to give you the kind of blessing that when you get up in the morning, it wakes up with you. The kind of blessing that when you go to bed at night, it goes to bed with you. The kind of blessing that'll keep you when you're up, that'll keep you when you're down. God said, I want the kind of blessing that is perpetual in your life. And so I've come to understand then that if I will allow God to perform the proper pruning the proper disciplining in my life uh, he will take me into a place of sustained fruitfulness a place where the blessings don't come and go they come and stay because he said surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life that God is saying to the body of Christ and to Jackson Revival Center I want to transition you into a place of sustained blessing. Now, please understand with me that sustained blessing is much more than houses. It's much more than money. It's much more than cars. That, that sustained blessing is having whatever you need whenever you need it. And some may say, well, how do I get there then, pastor? Well, the Bible said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That if you look in Psalm 23, uh, the way that the sheep stayed together, if one would begin to stray from the sheepfold, the shepherd would come with the rod of correction. In other words, David said, when I felt that rod, thy rod and thy staff uh, corrects me. He said, when I feel that, uh, when I felt that correction, when I felt that realignment, it comforted me because it let me know that God has not given up on me. Uh, it lets me know that anytime I get outside of the will of God and I don't feel that rod correcting me, I don't feel that rod realigning me, then I know I'm in trouble. Why? Because when the rod no longer comes, when the correction no longer comes, when there's no more alignment, that means God has withdrawn himself. So David said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me as long as he's correcting me I'm still comforted because if he loves me that means he's not given up on me Proverbs chapter 15 verse 32 said he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul but he that heareth reproof gets understanding can I just let you know that receiving correction can literally deliver your life from destruction? I believe it was Matthew Stevenson said, you cannot trust people that you cannot train. Uh, that you've got to be able to train them in order to be able to trust them. 
Uh, Proverbs 24, 6 said, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in a multitude of counselors there is safety. So this lets me know then that if I have the right voices, my chances for success have increased. That heeding instruction, even when it's instruction I don't like, it keeps me from destroying myself. Proverbs 15, 22 said, without wise counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in a multitude of counselors, they are established. That, that the word of God is saying, if I embrace wise counsel, that wise counsel can help decrease the disappointments I experience in my life. And so there are a lot of people who are disappointed because they are dealing with unmet expectations. People are, are grappling with unmet expectations, but there's no work going on to change them. And so this is why we are in a place where God said, I want you to teach on sonship. I want you to teach about what it means to be covered. I want you to teach on what it means to embrace the God's voice for your life. And so being able to receive a voice in your life is part of that journey of sonship. I knew that it would begin to get quiet, but, but how dangerous is it to be in a place in your life where there's not one person who can correct you? How dangerous is it to be in your life where you already know everything there is to be known and nobody knows what there is to know like you know it? See, everybody has to have somebody in your life who can pull your coattail. Everybody's got to have somebody in your life who don't care nothing about how gifted you are, how intelligent you are, how talented you are. Everybody's got to have a God-ordained voice in your life who don't care nothing about hurting your feelings, who don't care nothing about how mad you get or how many posts you make on Facebook to decret to discredit creditable voices because you don't want to change so we're talking this morning about receiving the voice of God from your life so I want to take you to the book of Ruth chapter 3 where we've got Ruth and Naomi now Oprah has already left Oprah already said y'all do what you're gonna do but I'm going back to the place I came from but we've got Ruth and Naomi and it was one instruction from Naomi that changed Ruth's life forever that with one instruction, Ruth went from being a widow who had lost everything to being the one who had caught Boaz's eye. That she went from begging in a field to owning the field she used to beg in. And the bridge from that place of loss and despair to the place of nothing missing, nothing broken was Naomi. The bridge was a generation ahead saying, now listen, I want to tell you a little something. Uh, I want to just tell you something because this is going to get you from where you are to where you need to go. But we've got a generation right now many times who doesn't want to hear the voice of anyone older because of other experiences in other places and see many times what you go through will condition you to expect the same thing you got there when you get here and so we see it play out in, in this situation with Naomi and Ruth. So now you've got Naomi telling Ruth, you've got to believe, Ruth, that God wants it to be well with you. Uh, sometimes we'll, people will fight you even when you're telling them God wants it to be well with you. There are some people who can't even take a word of encouragement and it's hard for Ruth to take it because of the place that she's in. 
sin. Ruth has been at the top. Ruth has fallen on hard times. Her husband has died. Now she is a beggar. She is homeless. Uh, She's got dirt between her toes. Her hair is matted together. She's having to live off of other people's leftovers. She's been a beggar and Naomi is telling her, but Ruth, I need you to believe God again. I need you to trust God again. And see, sometimes it's hard for people who have experienced heartache and pain to muster enough courage to reach again. It is hard for people who have experienced disappointment and loss to reach again, to believe again, to believe that God has something different for my tomorrow than the thing that I am experiencing today. But God said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the one that refuses to sit in the seat of the scornful. Ah, you got to understand. The Bible said, blessed is the one whose delight is the law of the Lord, who meditates in that law both day and night. You got to understand that God, he said, uh, the one that meditates in the law of the Lord, he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of living water, that his leaf will not wither before it's time, that the vine will not cast its fruit before it's time. In other words, God is saying that I want you to prosper and I want you to prosper in such a way that what you do don't die when you do. Oh, I feel the preach coming on. He said, I want you to be blessed in the city. I want you to be blessed in the field. I want you to be blessed in your coming in and blessed in your going out. Blessed when you're at rest and at leisure. But some people are so omniscient. Some people are so unteachable. That rather than cast your pearls before swine, you got to stand back and let folk experience the pain of their error. The bridge that got Naomi from, I'm sorry, Ruth from where she was to where she needed to be was Naomi. That there was somebody who said, I want to tell you what to do. She said, first of all, I want you to go and bathe yourself. Wash yourself, take a bath. In other words, she said, you cannot get in front of your future looking like and smelling like your past. She said, you cannot embrace your tomorrow with the residue of yesterday still resting on your shoulders. And I've been before the Lord saying, Lord, why the rejection? Why the opposition when what is being told is coming from a heart of love? Why the rebellious attitude? Why certain responses? And the Lord said, because there are people under you who refuse to deal with the residue of where they've been. You know, it's just like folk who used to live their life going to the club. Some folk don't go to the club anymore, but we know you used to because you still look like the club. You still sound like the club. You still act like you in the club. Some of us still look like where we came from. So, so Naomi told Ruth, you cannot embrace your future looking like your past. She said, I see what God has for you, Ruth. But what God has for you ain't going to be attracted to the mat in your hair. What what God has for you ain't going to be attracted to the dirt between your toes. What God has for you, you got to look like where you're going, not where you came from. Because if you saw Naomi at this point in time, Naomi would have been coming up to you looking like, I done lost my house, my credit is shot, my husband is dead. Naomi said, no, wash yourself, Ruth. 
put on your best clothes, put on your best perfume. And, and, and I want you to be in this place at this time. And the Bible said that Ruth did everything Naomi told her. And she ended up in a place of sustained and perpetual blessing. Why? Because she was willing to, to submit. She was willing to yield to the instruction of the Lord. See, I'm, I'm trying to keep it light. I'm trying to keep it easy. Some folks say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I'm going through hell right now. Everybody I know is going through hell right now. But what you got to understand is that what you are going through is not terminal. Trouble don't last forever. God wants it to be well with you. And there are many of you here today, many watching by way of our social media platforms. You are one instruction away from God changing your life forever. But see, it's not enough for other people to believe that for you. You have to believe that for yourself. That, that Ruth position, I'm sorry, Naomi positions Ruth where Boaz will see her. Now, you got to understand Boaz is a type of Christ. But notice where they find him. That Boaz is at the threshing floor. Can I just tell somebody, I know there's a lot in here who may not even know what the threshing floor is, but Jesus lives at the threshing floor. Uh, that don't mean anything to some of y'all, but see, whenever you harvest anything, there's a portion that you keep and there's a portion that you got to throw away. A threshing floor is where they would, would harvest the wheat. The, the wheat is what they would use to make the bread. And so when you harvested the wheat, there was something undesirable that would grow up with the wheat that was called the chaff. And so the wheat was heavier than the chaff. And so at the threshing floor, they would throw the wheat in the air and then the chaff would be blown away. Oh, y'all missed something right there. That the weight of the wheat would call the desirable parts to stay. But the wind would blow the undesirable parts away. And see, Jesus said, that's where I live right there. He said, I live in the place called the threshing floor. I live in the place where you are led by the weight of the Spirit. And then when the weight, the wind of the Holy Spirit begins to blow upon your life, that that is heavy, that that has some substance, that that's got some chutzpah, that that's got some, some stickability and some maturity, that's going to be right there. Let the wind blow all that it wants to blow. But you say, I'm too heavy. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be right here to experience the weight of God's glory in my life. Oh, I know it don't feel good, but these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, are working for you a far more eternal and exceeding heavy weight of glory. See, you gotta understand, you've been asking God, I wanna see your glory, show me your glory. God said you asked for it, but the glory comes through the battle. It's your battles that produce the weight in your life. It's the battle that produced the substance in your speaking. It is the battle that's producing what you're asking for. Oh yeah. Oh baby, I know you hate the battle. I hate the battle as much as you do, but you have no idea 
God said the shaft that is being blown away. Oh, I know you hate the struggle, but you have no idea how much mess and how much crud God is blowing out of your life as the wind of the Spirit continues to blow. Oh, I know we don't like a fight, but you have no idea when your life is being tossed to and fro. You feel like everything is in chaos. God said that's just the wind of the spirit blowing the chaff out so the wheat can take its place. I'm here to announce that God is about to let us experience a weight of his glory. I dare somebody to shout hallelujah. I dare somebody to look at somebody close to you and say, you didn't fight for nothing, boo. Tell them you ain't fighting for nothing. You're fighting for your future. The wheat will stay, but the chaff. See, what's necessary will stay, but the fluff has got to go. Say, well, God, what you're doing, I'm going to put you in a place that you're left with nothing but the glory. Tell your neighbor, I'm not going anywhere. Because the weight of his glory is too heavy for the wind to blow me off course. I dare you to say I'm too heavy. I dare you to say I'm too weighty. I was made for the threshing floor, baby. But I'm going to let God separate me from whatever he needs to separate me from. One, one, one. One instruction. One instruction. One instruction got her there. See, when the truth of the word of God comes into your life, it is the most powerful force you can ever experience. The issue was Ruth had been focused on her condition. Ruth had been focused on the fact that she was widowed, that she was hungry, that she was homeless, that she was empty. But Naomi focused not on her condition, but her position. Because Naomi said, I know that you look at your condition, but your position is that you are kin to Boaz. I dare you to tell somebody it's all about how you see it. You're looking at your condition frustrated. You're looking at your condition hot, mad. You're looking at your condition, I did this and I did that. But God said it's all in how you see your problem. It's all in what you allow to fill your field of vision. That's why David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. It, it wasn't that everything looked good. But he said if we will magnify him in what don't look good, what don't feel good, if we magnify him, we'll see him make it good and we'll begin to experience a God who with all things are possible. Naomi was not there to be a cheerleader. She was there for correction. She was there for direction. She was there for instruction. And so Ruth, uh, I'm sorry, Naomi brought Ruth to a place that Naomi's pain became Ruth's wisdom. There, there are two kinds of students. Those who receive the instruction act upon the instruction and complete the instruction given and those students bring honor. Then there are those who only reach out when there's loss, when there's lack, or when there's trouble or a complaint. And even then, no matter what you do, it ain't going to be enough. Proverbs 1, 5 said, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. 
A man of understanding will attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Naomi said, wash yourself, Ruth. Take a bath. You got too much residue on you for where God is taking you. Wash yourself. And so Ruth follows the instruction and she ends up in that place of perpetual and sustained blessing. Why? Because she could yield to the instruction of the Lord. First Kings chapter 19 verse 19. When Elijah found Elisha, he was behind an ox. They were in a field and there were 12 yoke of oxen and the Bible records he was the 12th. I'm painting the picture because I need you to understand what was in his view. That in his place, his view was the back end of an ox. Elijah is at number one. But he sees to number 12. And he sees behind number 12, there's somebody just sitting behind the butt of an ox. Doing what is before them to do. How crazy is that? To be in a place that you are following the same scenery day after day after day. A lot, a lot of folk this, this day and time wouldn't, wouldn't make it there. We're not going to do anything very long. But Elisha, day after day, following something less intelligent than himself. Every day, his focus, his view was the behind of an ox. But he was committed. God so saw fit to position him because he was faithful to stay behind the butt of an ox to make sure that what happened or that need what needed to happen on row 12 happened on row 12 elisha said i'm gonna be right here looking at the butt of this ox until i'm told to do something different fully committed to what was before him but it was his faithfulness to what was before him that positioned him to be in the right place at the right time to receive everything God had for him to do. Can I just help somebody this morning to the four or five listening to me on social media who actually want to hear what I got to say. Let me let somebody know that destiny defining moments take place every day. Destiny defining moments take place in the everyday average ordinary circumstances that in Elisha was simply a good steward of where he was. That the secret to blessing has everything to do with how you steward the ordinary. The secret of success has everything to do with how you handle where you already are. Oh, y'all don't want to hear a white girl on a Sunday morning, but see how you handle ordinary, how you handle not enough, how you handle uh, the mundane, how you handle the average how you handle the status quo is a picture of what you will do with the extraordinary that you got to understand everyday moments prepare ordinary people for extraordinary exploits 
See, character is developed in the everyday moments of your life. Integrity is cultivated in the everyday moments. The fruit of the Spirit matures in the everyday moments. Christ likeness comes into being in the everyday moments. Righteousness comes into being in the everyday moments of your life. And that's what folk have to understand. That God's vantage point includes so much more than the human eye is capable of capturing. It's, it's, it's tempting to settle sometimes with success or victory tempting you know you reach a place of success you you reach a moment of victory it's it's tempting to settle there but the truth is that for every success God has something even bigger prepared because you got to understand God is a God of greater works his vision is not for something that is fleeting or forgettable. Uh, his vision is for something that is sustained and supernatural. Elijah was looking for soil to sow into. Elijah was looking for somebody, anybody, one body that was hungry for the perpetuation of purpose. Elijah was searching for a place of deposit, but could find none. Elijah had a mantle. Elijah had experience. Elijah had wisdom. Elijah had revelation. He had something to impart. Elijah had something to release, but could not find a spot to receive the release. Even though, Elder O'Hara, there were 7,000 in Israel who had refused to bow their knee to Baal. But it was not until Elijah saw Elisha looking at the butt of an ox that he said, there's the place of deposit. See, one thing Elijah knew, he could not continue to waste his time sowing in unresponsive ground. Well, I'll talk about it if you can handle it. But see, the ground has to be fertile soil. And Elijah discerned that Elisha was worthy of the seed. What's your seed? That's, that's your time. That's your energy. That is your passion. That is your efforts. That is your sweat. That is your tears. That is your intercession. That is your contending. Elijah had to know that Elisha was a, a potential carrier of purpose. Can I tell you something? We are living in a day and a time right now where the power of God is looking for people who are investable. But Elisha is proof that when you can learn to handle the ordinary moments, as if they were extraordinary moments. You won't ever have to chase what God has for you. What God has for you will come looking for you. <sighs> hmm. <Whew>. <laughs> Bible said that Elijah walked by Elisha and he threw his mantle on him. There was no ceremony, there was no service, there was no red tape, there was no email, there was no meeting with the board. See, there are some anointings that only have to hit your life one time and they will change your life forever. One divine moment.
moment orchestrated by the master can change everything. Oh my God, may this be the kind of ministry where you only have to come in contact with it one time and when the anointing hits your life, it changes you forever. He threw his mantle on him and that was Elisha's training. Stay put, do what I tell you to do and pour water on my hand. See, a lot of them, they would have been moved right there because the instruction that came behind an extraordinary moment was not an extraordinary instruction. It was stay put, do what I tell you to do, and pour water on my hands. That's why we're not seeing miracle signs and wonders because don't nobody want to stay put, don't nobody want to do what they're told to do, and they sure don't want to pour water on nobody's hand because that's not glamorous. See, there are several crises that you got to learn how to face and handle on the road to greatness. And one of them will be the crisis of your faith. What you talking about, Pastor? What are you talking about the crisis of your faith? Well, see, at some point in time in your life, you have to deal with whether or not you really have confidence in the word of the Lord. See, 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 the proof of the existence of God is change. The proof of the existence of God is your ability to allow God to bring change. God is a creator. And us allowing God to change us is critical. And so a crisis of your faith looks a little bit like this. Is the Bible the word of God for your life or do you view the Bible as just other people trying to control you? Because as long as you do not see the word of God as the inspired word of God and you only hear it from the carnal perception of where you've been or what you've experienced. You'll never see it for what it really is. And so you got to come to the place that you say, I believe the, the Bible is the unadulterated word of God. Now, yes, it must be preached within context. Context is key. So it's got to be preached in context. But see, what part of the Bible do you believe? Because, see, we, we cherry pick according to what we like and according to what we don't like. And so um, my question for you is, what parts of it have you been fully persuaded of? Because there are a lot of people who will embrace the healing part of the Bible. But they won't embrace any other part of the Bible. There are, there are some who will embrace uh, the healing part, but won't embrace the financial part. There, there's some who will embrace the financial part, uh, but they don't believe any of the part of sonship or any of the part of uh, the willing and obedient. They want all those words scrapped out. Can I tell you the only part that's going to work for you is the part that you believe? And so that's why we'll sit back and when pastors prophesy in houses and cars and elevation and promotion, we'll say, preach it, pastor, because we believe that. But when we preach you the part that tells you how to get there and stay there, now you're trying to be a slave master. And so I get confused sometimes 
on when I'm supposed to preach and when I'm supposed to sit back and when I'm supposed to let you treat me like a piece of dirt and when I, I get confused when you honor me with your lips. Is the word truth or is it not? Is all of it truth or just the parts you like? Because it is the word of God in you that determines the strength of God in you. Faith then we said, we said one of the crises you're going to face is, a, is, a, face is a crisis of your faith. Because the word of the Lord came to Elisha through Elijah. When he saw someone who was investable. When he saw someone worthy of his time and his effort and his strength and his energy. When he saw somebody who wanted a, pla a pastor and not just a platform. When, when he saw that, Elijah said, all right, I got time for that. Elisha said, I'm ready. I've been behind the butt of an ox just doing what I've been called to do because I just want to be found faithful. You ain't got to call my name. You ain't got to pat my back. I ain't got to be on camera. I just want to be doing what God called me to do. He said, all right, stay put. Do what I told you to do and pour water on my hands. <laughs> okay, this is where faith is put to the test. Because so many of us, we already have in our mind how God should do what we want him to do. And so when God comes another way, it throws us off. So the question becomes, is your faith in God and in his word? Or is your faith in the way you thought it should come about? Okay, so, so now faith. Faith is being sent out. Faith is being authorized and deputized by Elisha. Because when he said, all right, I'll stay put, I'll do what you told me to do, and I'll pour water on your hands. Now, faith is the obtainer that if you stay put, do what I told you to do, and pour water on my hands, faith is the thing that goes and gets what God said is attached to you staying put, doing what I told you to do, and pour water on my hands. Faith is the obtainer of the promise. What is faith? Faith is confidence in God's ability to fulfill his word. See, most people who are struggling with this are struggling because you do not believe God is who he said he is. You do not believe that God is capable of doing what he said he would do if you just follow his word. It's a crisis of faith. Your, your, your confidence in God is going to be tested. So when Elijah's time was up, he looked at Elisha. The one he said, stay put, do what I tell you to do, and pour water on my hands. When Elijah's time was up, he looked at Elisha. He said, what can I do for you? <laughs> See, it didn't happen when Elisha thought that it should happen. Elijah knew Elisha had what it took when he saw his ability to stay put behind the butt of an ox. See, when you can do the thing that has no rhyme, no reason, don't make sense to you, don't bring no glory to you, don't bring no honor to you, but when you can be faithful to that, not because you love the ox, not because you love the person dropped, but because you love the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Elijah looked at Elisha and said, what shall I do for you? Elisha been waiting on the question. Elisha said that I may have a double portion of your spirit. Elijah said, all right, if you see me when I go up, you can have it. Go through your word, count them. Elisha performed double the miracles of Elijah. Why? Because he was willing to follow the instruction of the Lord. Jesus did not release 12 apostles until he first called himself 12 disciples. That, that they didn't become apostles till they walked with him and they talked with him. They shared life with him. They walked with him. They saw him fast. They saw him pray. And they followed his instruction. He said, it's not until you can walk with me that you can carry my mantle. This is why you see folks, pastors specifically committing suicide. This is why you see pastors by the day, thousands, quitting, resigning, giving up by the day. Because we got a lot of folk who want our mantle but will not walk with us. He brought them alongside him. You got to understand, God has in, deposited something incredible inside each and every one of you. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in a field. That the treasure is precious, the field is dirt. But for the joy of the treasure. He sold everything he had and bought the field. He recognized that in order to get to the treasure, I'm going to have to deal with the dirt. And he said, I'll buy the whole field, dirt and all, just to get to what is special. Because in spite of all the dirt, I see the treasure. I'll deal with the dirt to get to the treasure. First Corinthians said, no eye has seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. There is something so big, there is something so great inside of you. There's something great that runs on the inside of me. But the Bible said the wells of a man run deep. And it takes someone of understanding to draw it out. It takes someone who understands your potential to draw it out. And so many of you are frustrated because you are in environments. You have intentionally surrounded yourself with people who agree with you. But they're not able to pull out of you what God has placed in you. The reason why some of you are stuck is not because you don't have anything in you. But because you've not allowed older people around you. Who are able to draw it out. Everybody has blind spots. And the blindest one of all is the one who says I have none. Everybody disagreeing with you is not against you. Everybody disagreeing with you does not want to see you fail. There's got to be people around you who are able to draw it out. As a matter of fact, there are some people around you who want to make sure what's in you stays in you. Because see, when you move forward, it's an indictment against the, the, the fact that some people have no goal. Some people have uh, no dream. Some people aren't going anywhere because they don't want to. 
And so when they see other people moving and going and doing things and they're stuck, they want everybody else to be stuck with them. They want company in their stuckness. But see, when you begin to step out and say, I want to surround myself with people who see something inside of me. But I'm going to give somebody permission to hurt my feelings. I'm going to give somebody permission to say what I don't want to hear. And trust that just because it hurt my feelings don't mean they're against me. No rebuke, no correction in the moment seems pleasurable. But in the end, it brings forth life. Somebody has got to be trusted enough. And it needs to be somebody who ain't your same age. I know some of y'all don't believe it right now, but there's something to be said for experience. If not, Jesus was Jesus when he was born. Why did he have to mature to 33? I dare somebody to say, God, pull it out of me. It takes embracing God's voice because, see, the voice of your friends will accept your weakness. The voice of your enemies will exploit your weakness. But the voice of God will remove your weakness. When I get here on Sunday morning, my job is not to play with you. My job is not to accept everything you're selling. That's one of the things in, in, in this time of prayer, because I'm telling you, I have, I have met a, cro a crossroad in my life. Oh, I'm so serious. See, I don't, I don't have to preach to live. Preaching is not what sustains my life. So I don't do this because I'm stuck doing it. I do this because I'm called to it. There's a big difference. But there are a lot of people who want to be around you who don't understand your purpose, your function in life. And so as a pastor, when you attempt to be relational with people, people will exploit the relationship. Because we think love is agreement. We think love is going along with the get along. But love is telling you the truth. My job is to remove the weaknesses that surround your potential and keep it buried. And you don't always do that handing out lollipops. But I stand and I say, what would the church look like if we didn't surround ourselves with people who accept our weaknesses or exploit our weaknesses, but we would surround ourselves with people who remove the weakness? And help us to stay free from what we get free from. 
I know I've gone a little bit longer than usual today. But I'm helping somebody. I'm helping those who can hear me by the Spirit. Stop expecting people to accurately assess you. That's what the Lord told me. No matter how much you love them, no matter how much you pour in, stop expecting them to accurately assess you. Jesus was cleaning out hospitals, opening blinded eyes, open up deaf ears, causing the lame to walk until he got around folk who thought they knew him. Until he got around folk who thought they were familiar with him. When he got around those folk, home folk, that's when he got the folk saying, he's no Messiah, he ain't nothing. He builds benches. He's a carpenter. That's Joseph's boy. Because people receive you as they perceive you. And see, you want, to, you want me to be pastor, but you don't receive me as that. You want me to be pastor when I need to fix something. So as long as you're just so-and-so, you can do no mighty works there. You can do nothing great in the midst of people who expect little. You got to be around people who demand greatness from you. And this is why many misunderstand me because I demand something from you. You don't demand from yourself. And so because you don't demand better from you, you get offended when I demand better from you. Shame on Jesse. When they came to Jesse's house looking for a king, he didn't even call David out. He didn't even invite David into the party. When they came to his house looking for a king, Jesse had a king but didn't even know the king was resting in a little boy that was on the back side of the mountain making sure that the sheep were taken care of. Jesse only saw the little boy. Nobody was more surprised when David became king than his own father. Well, I wish I could tell you that the people closest to you are going to see what's in you. But a lot of the folk around you are going to be blind to what is within you. I'm going to help who will hear me. The voice of God may not always come through your friends. But you better understand, God knows how to look down through all your dirt and find your treasure. And when he does, deep begins to call unto deep. And the voice of God begins to activate stuff on the inside of you. It begins to awaken things within you. And all of a sudden, you're moving into stuff you never could have dreamed of. I dare somebody to shout hallelujah. Somebody ought to just begin to praise him right there. Somebody ought to begin to worship him right there. I 
just said somebody ought to worship him right there because God is doing a thing even in this moment even right here he's doing a drive by he's sweeping by because even in this moment some healing is getting ready to take place God is saying do you trust me do you trust me in spite of what you've been through, in spite of where you've been, in spite of who has hurt you? Do you trust me? Do you trust me to heal what you don't know how to heal? Do you trust me to fix what you don't know how to fix? is what the house of God is about that it's not coming it's not about us coming to get to feel good the house of God is about us coming and allowing him to reach behind the hidden places the house of God is about us coming to have the hard conversations it's about us coming to do the work. But God says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to allow me to do what needs to be done? We put so much trust in so many things. When you walked in this building, you did not question who put its beams in their place. Before you sat down in your chair, you didn't look to see who put it together, what company manufactured it. You didn't look to see if all the screws were in their place. No, you just rested all, rested all your weight in that chair. And you sat down because you trusted that it was able to hold you. How many rides do you inspect when you take your children to the state fair and allow them to take your children hundreds of feet up in the air? How many times did you expect it and see who put it together? Do you really know your child's teacher at school? But they have them pouring into them eight hours a day. Did, did you check the record of the person who's driving your baby's bus? Do you know their driving history? Do you know their record for yourself? Did you inspect the vehicle? No. When you order chicken at the Chinese restaurant, I just try to throw a little humor in there for those of you who were. But I said all that to say this. <laughs> we will so quickly put our lives in the hands of things that are not proven, in the hands of things, and we'll do it quicker than we will trust people who have a record before us and whose walk has been proven. So before we go any further, we got to have a conversation. A conversation about trust. If you've made up your mind, That every church and every pastor and every leader is backwards, stay off the platform. Until you can allow God to heal that in you, stay off the platform. Stay off the platform, stay off the instruments, stay off the doors.
Pastor, but you don't understand. Have a conversation with me. If you don't want me to deal with it openly, don't do it openly. Because I refuse to have another Sunday where I have to preach over. your social media posts because you refuse to get before the Lord and get healed. When I go directly to a leader, as a leader, leaders speak to leaders. And when leaders say from the pastor, this, this, and this. It's not for you to get on social media and discuss what you don't like. Because what sometimes people up here don't understand is people out here have a relationship with the Lord. We know if you're up here to be seen or if you are up here because you love the Lord. And if I say something different needs to happen, you need to respect me as enough as a pastor to trust that as my pastor, she has my best interest at heart. As my pastor, she has this church at heart. And if you cannot trust that, you need to find somewhere that you can. The Bible says open rebuke is better than secret love. See, I watch stuff. I watch to see if you come to church if you're not singing. The people who come when they're not singing, that's who I want on the platform. I don't mind telling you, I looked Wednesday night. To see who came because they weren't singing. And the ones you see up here right now, they were here for service. They weren't here to sing. They were here for service. <laughs> see, if you're not here for service, I don't want you trying to lead me somewhere you hadn't been. You can't lead me into the presence of the Lord if you're here to be seen. Y'all all right? This is sonship. This is maturity. This is not abuse. But because you don't know how to define love, you'll call it abuse. Because we think love is agreement. Love is mercy and truth. He says, trust me with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. He said, in all of your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. If you cannot be corrected, you are not a son. If you cannot be corrected, you are not a daughter. See, I'm, I'm the kind of mama, if you show out in the store, I'm going to wait till I get you to the car. But if you show out in the store again, I'm going to get you in the store because you showed out in the store. I've been all mercy. I've been all grace. And the moment that I get my gun at my house and load the bullets in the chamber, and it takes all of God to keep me from pulling the trigger, it's time to set the house in order.
week before last. week before last because I allowed people I got my gun I got my bullets I put all of them in the chamber I closed it up and I sat by the side of my bed in the middle of the day with the sun shining bright and it took all of God in me not to pull the trigger. I'm not mentally ill. But I have a heart for people. And my heart is sometimes bigger than my sense. And I give ear to everybody's foolishness. And I give time to everybody's everything. But it's over. It's dealt with. And I trust God enough to let the chips fall where they may. You can't build on sinking sand. So I gave you truth. Now what you do with it is up to you. There are some people who need to come today. Some on our social media platforms. Some in the building. who say, Pastor, I need to come for healing. I need to come because I got some trust issues. And they didn't come from here, but I brought them with me here. And because I brought them with me, I've allowed them to infiltrate my ability to trust you as my pastor. I've allowed it to infiltrate my ability to trust the people around me as my family. And if that's you, this is your opportunity to come. Play what you were playing a while ago. Hallelujah. Y'all can sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and just lift up your hands and begin to worship.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we come right now on behalf of those who are watching, on behalf even of those who are here. Father, we thank you that we are not ignorant concerning the enemy's devices. Father, we thank you that the light has been shined into the midst of dark places. Father, we thank you that mercy and truth have been applied. Now, Father, we ask for deliverance in this house. Father, we ask for deliverance for those who are watching by way of our social media platforms. Father, we ask that the enemy would have no place, but that, Father, there would be forgiveness, that there would be love. Father, that there would be restoration of that that is right. We thank you, Father, that what needed to be torn down has been torn down. We thank you that what needed to be revealed has been revealed. And now, Father, we thank you that we can move forward building on a solid, stable foundation. We thank you, Father, that the wheat will remain and the chaff will be blown away. Now, Father, we thank you that 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 remains after the shaking, after the blowing of the wind, will produce the glory of God. And Father, I thank you for the glory that I see coming. I thank you for the weight of your glory that I see resting upon this house. I thank you for the deliverances that will be wrought. Father, just when they walk in the door, that before a song is sung, before a message is preached, before a note is played, I thank you that deliverance will hit even in the parking lot. I thank you, Lord for what you're doing I thank you for what you're doing that people don't even yet see we give you praise we give you glory we give you honor in Jesus name now father for those who want to give their life to Christ right now we come and we pray father that this would be one of the best decisions that they've ever made that they would be blessed in their coming in blessed in their going out blessed when they're at work and when they're at rest Father, we pray right now that you would crown their efforts with great success. Father, we ask that they would be faithful to give of their tithe, faithful to give of their offering, faithful to give of the gifts and the talents you've placed on the inside of them. Father, we ask that together you would help us to do the work you've called us to do. Father, for those giving their life to you, we ask that you forgive them of all their sins. Cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Write their name in the Lamb's book of life. Fill them with your spirit and use them from this day forward. Now, Father, we thank, the, thank you for those giving their life to you. We thank you for those coming to be added to this local body. Father, use us all together to collectively do your work until you return. We thank you now. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we thank God. I know it's been a little different day, but the will of the Lord has been done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The will of the Lord has been done. And it's onward and upward from here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you once again for this day. 
We thank you once again for the boldness, the courage, and the strength to deliver your word. Never again will we allow Satan to back us into a corner. Never again will we not call it like we see it. Never again will we not say it like it is. We thank you, Father, for maturity. We thank you for growth. We thank you for what's coming. We thank you that we're prepared. Now have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can you give the Lord a good hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. 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 Hear my humble cry. While, while on others, thou art calling, do not pass me by. Come on and sing. Savior. Something else I feel led to do too because there's more than likely see it, it takes vulnerability to deliver the word of God you don't get to hide your wounds you don't get to hide your scars you don't get to pretend you're perfect while you deal with everybody else's closet everybody has to deal with their own but there's somebody watching today I sense you, I feel you, and you're in a place that you're not sure life is worth continuing to live. Let somebody who's been there pray for you. Let somebody who's been there let you know the Lord wants it to be well with you. I know it don't look good right now. I know it don't feel good right now, but the Lord wants it to be well with you. And what's ahead of you is so much better than what's in front of you right now. And if you'll allow me to, I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, right now I pray for every man, every woman, even those who may be younger, who are listening today, who are under the sound of my voice. Father, I thank you right now for the will to live. Father, I thank you that for somebody who is so overshadowed and overtaken by the cares of this life, I pray that every burden would be lifted. I pray that every yoke would be destroyed. I pray right now, Father, that they would grasp and catch hold. You loved us so much that you sent your son and he said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And Father, yes, we know we hit rough places. Yes, we know that we have days that are dark. Yes, we know we have moments where we are weak. But thank you for life that sustains us. Thank you for the promise of peace. Thank you for the promise of joy. And now, Father, I pray that just like you gave me the strength in that moment not to pull the trigger, 
that, Father, you'll give them the strength not to do whatever the enemy has put it in their mind for them to do. We're not looking for quick fixes. We're not looking for easy outs. We're looking for wholeness. We thank you for healing. And I thank you, Father. For those who have heard this word, they will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Want to let you know you can meet us back here Wednesday night. Um, I want to change the time from 6.30 to 6. This will be our last Wednesday night service before we begin to come back into the building. Everybody will not be able to come at once, uh, but we will roll out a plan for you this week so that people will know the steps and can begin to make plans. But this Wednesday will be our last midweek service until after we begin coming back together in the building. So I'm going to ask everybody to come from 6 to 7.30 instead of 6.30 to 8. I think the mosquitoes will not be as bad. Uh, Dr. Collins called. She's going to have someone to come and spray. Uh, so we thank God for that. But I think if we come a little bit earlier, they will not be as bad. So we'll do 6 to 7.30 instead of 6.30 to 8. So 6 to 7.30 this Wednesday night. I'm going to be preaching on discernment. And we're also going to, to have a little bit of corporate prayer uh, to cover our corporate prayer for the month of September. So it'll be good. Uh, come out. But we're going to do 6 to 7.30 this coming Wednesday. Amen? Amen. Everybody join with your neighbor, join with your family and say, neighbor, I pray the blessings of the Lord rest upon you, everything and everyone connected to you. May the spirit of the living God keep your heart, your mind and your body in perfect peace in Jesus name. Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You're dismissed. God bless you. Love somebody on the way out.